Seminole, uh, parts of Largo, Clearwater, and Clearwater Beach, uh, South Beaches, uh, Bel Air, Bel Air Beach, uh, Luffs, Indian Rocks, uh, and, and unincorporated uh, around the Bay Pines. Um, I'd just like to compliment our, uh, our legislative delegation, first of all, as being one of the strongest uh, delegations in the legislature. I think we arrived in the Miami Bay County uh, when it comes to uh, being able to get things done um, at that level. And, and certainly this year, uh, a good example of it, especially in the bipartisanship way, were the things that some of the things that were mentioned, like the election reform bill. Uh, we had five counties out of 67 um, yeah. that weren't able to get it done uh, with, with, under, the, under the new law. So we were able to examine that closely and do a, a good bipartisanship effort, uh, make some, I think, fairly simple corrections and upgrades So 
Americans that are funded below 80%. Some are funded below 50%. And some of those, um, and some of those that actually the, the, the cities and the participants opted out of Social Security years ago. So this is all they have. And so what we've done is we've created what I think is the most transparent pension program in the United States. We're saying you can report whatever your long-term obligations are uh, in, in, internally, and you can fund to those levels, but you must disclose 200 basis points below that. Because what was happening is they're saying, we're going to get 8% for the rest of the time. And unfortunately, they were getting 2% or 1%, or sometimes negative returns in some years. So I think this will provide us a much more fair, balanced way to look at our transparent transparent pensions. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dwight Dudley, represent the St. Pete Federal Support Part of Bellman. Uh, it's an honor serving. I'm uh, brand new. I'm a novice in some respects. I did have the pleasure of working as a staff person way back in the 80s, from 80 to 84, uh, for the House of Representatives as an analyst on committee staff. I'm a Democrat. I would like to sing Kumbaya, and I imagine you'll hear more about that later, but I have not been breaking any song just yet. Uh, one of the great disappointments uh, for me was not expanding health care, and I was on the PPACA committee, Patient Protection Affordable Health Care Act committee, and from my perspective, it seemed very much preordained and decided well before we got to sit in the chairs at the committee hearings from start to finish. I don't know how anybody can say 150,000 people by spending $237 million when we spent an additional approximately $65 million to cover a million more people would make a lot more sense. Um, I know that the, I don't want to cast aspersions here uh, unfairly, I do see some people in the state that voted for uh, expanding health care for the working families and poor families. Uh, I believe uh, Senator Lavell did. Um, I think uh, yeah, Carl Zimmerman certainly did, and, and uh, uh, Daryl Sons certainly did. Uh, the Senate mostly did. It was only one, only one vote against. Uh, I think it's a tremendous failing, and you know we've got to do better. I, I filed legislation to repeal the utility been a very important issue for me. Uh, that was not heard, and to me, that's the element of okay, growth. It's yeah. not about you know what the PSC does, tinkering around the edges, nibbling at the problem. The elephant in the room is that we're allowing power companies to take our money. We didn't tell them they could. I offered an amendment to put it to a vote to allow the people to decide if they want to be taxed in this fashion to build things for power companies. That didn't pass that bill. Truth in billing also didn't pass. We have a right to know what's in our bills. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ed Hooper, and I represent 367, which is the eastern parts of Clearwater, Largo, and the northeastern part of Miles Park, and some of beautiful Miles Park. Um, thank you again for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. And I always tell the lawyers that no one's ever getting the bell rung. Um, I there may be members sitting at this table that don't know they're in their last term. I can tell you I'm in my last term because I can't run again. So uh, I am the turned out member sitting at this table today. And that's some good and some bad. But, uh, it is what it is. And uh, the citizens voted for term limits. And we all knew that when we ran for office. Uh, 
Uh, so I will miss it now, as the after next session. Uh, as a senior member, I'm on seven committees in the House. I uh, lead the full appropriations committee, the joint legislative budget commission, the uh, committee on economic affairs, the committee on the roof and calendar, the committee on highways. I'm 
on things like Florida Forever, Spring Protection, the Everglades, and a number of things that have always been very important to me. Uh, our delegation worked together on to welcome the new members, especially my, my new colleague in the Senate, Senator Brandis, who distinguished himself uh, in a number of very innovative bills that he had and his work on transportation. So thank you very much. I think that's all the senators we can stand up for in the Tennessee. I'm uh, Representative Kathleen Peters. I represent District 69, which is southwest Pinellas County. I've got many of our beaches south of Park Boulevard all the way to the Bayway Bridge. Um, and I'm really pleased to be back, and it was a great first session for me. And I know the senator talked about the money that came out of this session, but you know what I want to talk about? And we heard all about this when we were campaigning and how polarized our country is. And what I can tell you is, this year, in our legislature, that is not what we saw. And I'm not sure if my colleagues are going to disagree with me. Maybe on some issues we were a little separated. But I would like to know, when was the last time we had a major overhaul in education? We overhauled the, the high school education we did a comprehensive bill to give our students alternative tracks for graduation that were not only college prep, but career training. And they're good tracks for them to have a good job to provide us the workforce skills that we need in the businesses we have in our state so that we can grow this business, grow our economy, and diversify our economy. And we had votes of 117 in vote. 117 and 0. And I'm sure Mr. Kreisman could even say, how often did we have on a major overhaul of education 117 and 0 votes? And so what I can tell you is we had great leadership. And on numerous bills that were filed in the House of Representatives, those were the votes, those were the numbers, 117 and 0. And I am so proud to work with the leadership that we have on committees and with the leadership we had in the House to make sure that our education bills were the right bills. And that's why we have 117 and Because Carl was on committee with me, and every time we had an idea or we thought something had to be changed, the chairmen and the leadership were willing to listen to what everyone had to say, and they took all the good policies and did the politics out of it. And we were not polarized, and that's why we had a successful session. And you will see great legislation come out, not only in education and early learning, Education for high school, we had great girls come out for foster care, and it is about time we took care of our foster care kids. And we had great girls come protecting our foster care kids and giving them a normal life. And I'd love to talk more about it, and I know I'm going to run out of time. I'm also proud to have three of my priorities come home, um, and, and that has to do with safety college and one of their programs, our submerged land that we had uh, multi family home uh, residents paying unnecessary taxing fees that weren't equitable and fair. And then we're also able to protect our, our beaches for beach nourishment when we lost so much sand in tropical storm Debbie. So I know I'm running out of time, and I'll pass that on. Good afternoon. I think I'll stand in too. Stand up too, because I don't want to blend in. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a danger.
but thank God we came back this year to make it a little bit better, but hopefully when we go back, we'll do more. Uh, it is a process. You, you, you can't always get what you want right away, but you work through it. Uh, I'm very proud that we did stand strong on some things in Tallahassee, like ethics reform. We could have uh, done a little bit more. All we did was switch out CTEs to ECOs and EBOs and EUs and all those kinds of things that's going to pop up. And with transparency, I mean, how, good, how well does it serve for those who stand in the back the day before the election? Uh, you still stand. Uh, in any event, the biggest boondoggle or loss of the session for me and for many of my colleagues and my constituents was the failure to pass health care. And I believe that the Democratic caucus stood strong on that. Thank God the Senate got it. Thank God the governor got it. But somehow the House totally missed it. And that was a shame. And we hope that we can come back next year and do something. I don't think we're done for the year. I do believe that there will be a special session. And it might even be in October when we go back to committee rates so the taxpayers don't have to double pay for us to go back and fix what we should have fixed. Um, I did serve on five committees uh, this session. It was a very busy session. Uh, I was ranking member on three of the five committees. And I'm really proud to bring home the leadership of the Democratic Office back to Pinellas County. It's been since 1994 to 96 when Peter Ruby Bottles was the last Democratic speaker or leader that we've had the leadership from Pinellas on the Democratic side. And I think that that will hold well for our community. Thank you. My name is Carl Zimmerman, and I represent North Pinellas County. I'm uh, Dunedin, Tarpon, Countryside, uh, in Palm Harbor, East Lake, and uh, Jefferson East Lake. Uh, I also represent, I'm a teacher. So I also represent Countryside High School, where I teach, and my principal is sitting over there. Two students from my school are over there as well. Uh, and I represent Pinellas County Schools, and I represent St. Pete College, and I represent USF. Uh, I represent all of education in Florida, and I was privileged, truly privileged, in the minority party to be allowed to be on the three education committees this year. Uh, I was on the K-12 committee, I was on the Bureau uh, through um, Early Learning, thanks, uh, uh, and then the uh, Higher Education and Workforce. Um, and it gave me a really unique position because the last 20 years I've written editorials about what I felt needed to be done in education. And it was a very frustrating thing to be a teacher and to feel so strongly about this and not see any movement. And this year, I am incredibly proud to be part of these committees. And as Kathleen said, we worked so closely together, and we, we passed a major overhaul in education, right from birth all the way through the grades one. Um, some of the things we did was, uh, we're, we're about to embrace, um, some of us are about to embrace, I'm cautious to embrace the common core standards. Um, and with that come new intercourse exams. These intercourse exams were supposed to be 100% pass or fail. So a child could do really well in the course, take a, a test that nobody's ever taken before, fail and not be allowed to graduate. And thanks to Dr. Grego, who was a, a, one of our leaders, uh, Superintendent Grego, uh, who came before us and other superintendents, we were able to reduce that to 30% of the final grade in the course exam. And that was a, a huge plus for us to do. Uh, we were also able to create, originally in the House version, we had three different diplomas. Uh, we adopted the Senate version, it was two different diplomas. And it provides for what the, the of what I've wanted to do with education for all these years is to give an interview for the 80% of the students that will not get a full year degree within six years of graduating. And we were doing nothing for those people before. Now those people are going to be going through school through career planning. And we're, they're able to take something that may not be their vocational interest, but simply their avocational interest right now and we use that to teach them courses like biology and physics. But as it adapts to auto mechanics, as it adapts to uh, microbiology or whatever course they, they choose to go through. So that's, as far as I'm concerned, one of the biggest accomplishments. It was a thrill and thank you very much.
All right, what we're going to do now is give the question. I'm going to ask the first question, and then we're going to ask each one of the legislators to pick from the audience a question. And we'll start at the end of the table with questions from Representative Zimmerman and work our way up. But my question has to deal with the issue of leadership. We've heard a couple of people refer to it. I'm going to ask all of the panel members to, as quickly as possible, uh, give me your assessment, assessment of the leadership uh, in your respective chamber uh, with respect to how fair you think it was, not whether you agree with the priorities, but how fair you think it was in terms of whether you were a minority or a majority party member and getting your views across. So let's start with Representative Horn. In the House, uh, Will Webster is the speaker. And um, while as a Democrat, there were many things that uh, the speaker tried to push through, uh, including the House version of health care, uh, that I disagreed with, tremendously disagreed with. Uh, I have to say that um, Speaker Weatherford was very welcoming to me. Uh, he was very fair to me. And uh, while none of my bills got hurt, which probably had nothing to do with the speaker, uh, uh, he, he was a very pleasant person and a very fair person in point of his being uh, fairer than previous speakers. Um, on the Democratic side, we've had wonderful leadership, and I look forward to uh, Daryl Roussan two years ago. Thank you. Some of you may recall that in 2009, I was the lone Democrat in the House that voted for the budget. And even though our Senate Democrats voted for the same budget, 43 members of the House on the Democratic side voted against it. I voted for it because I uh -huh. think it contained some things that were very important, not only to my community, but to the state of Florida. And my mom told me, if you ask a man for something, he give you something you don't bite his hand. I'm proud to say that this time, there were more than half of the Democratic caucus that voted for the budget. And that was because, for the first time in many cycles, and Representative Christ, you know what I'm talking about, uh, there was inclusiveness. And we respect the fact that I have started. <laughs> um, you know, I really have to do, and I, I spoke earlier on our speaker, I think Speaker Weatherford did an outstanding job at allowing the chairman to run their committees as they wanted to in the room. And I really did. And we all had a fair shot at talking to those chairmen and saying, can we get the bill heard? Is there any way you can assist me? Um, I felt that he was very inclusive. He didn't weigh in. There were other bills that had come up that they just didn't weigh in. And, and I, I was pleased with the process. And as I said, I don't believe in all the years that I watched the legislature through my other jobs that I recall as many bills as we had that went unanimous behind the 17 and 0. And I was very proud of that. And that all is attributed to leadership. Yeah, if you want to know why Daryl Rasson votes for the budget, read it. Uh, the, uh, the Turkey Report, uh, I heard come out tomorrow. And he's going to have his own chapter. <laughs> Representative Hooper is going to run a close second. Uh, I would give uh, I would give our Senate President an A for his in inclusiveness. Uh, all of us, not just uh, you know Republicans, not just Democrats, but even those Republicans of us uh, which I've been known to be, which uh, aren't always on the same page. Uh, he, he was very inclusive with all of us. I came into this process with Will Weatherford and, and sort of grew up in the house with him. He's still eight years younger than my son, uh, but he's wise beyond his years. I think Will reached out to the minority party for, and I can assure you that the last three speakers did, because he's my fourth speaker, and he did engage the minority party. And Darrell we saw does have a bed in the appropriations suite that he stays in all the time. Um, unfortunately, there was one incident where, and, and if I offend anyone of the minority caucus, I apologize. You guys disrespected Will with your uh, trick of reading the bills in full. He, he, he was hurt by that, and I think he certainly had a right to be hurt. And I wish that hadn't happened. Oh, sorry, that's a good one. Uh, that is a good one. Yeah. Well, I don't really expect, you know, Will Weatherford is probably the nicest guy 
you never wanted to uh, not shepherd your bills through committees uh, with. But anyway, I mean, that's the thing. Uh, it is like, it is a partisan process. I don't think uh, wait for the tooth fairy either. But, uh, you know, Will's a very pleasant guy to deal with. But major failings, the preordained uh, Medicaid issue, didn't have the speakers. We offered speakers to the to the speaker uh, presenters on Medicaid that did not get chosen, and I, I think that's a failing for the most part. You know, I think the biggest difference I have spent the last two, uh, two years in the House and transitioned over to the Senate, and, and I'll just tell you, uh, I can tell everyone, the House is like a military organization. It's got generals, it's colonels, it's captains, and soldiers. And the Senate is like a bunch of Somali warlords. <laughs> But the, the way that it worked this year was, was the Senate followed the rules. And it, it's amazing the difference when you have a chamber that actually follows and are clearly articulates and yet follows the rules. And you have a presiding officer who is intent on following the rules. There was only a handful of bills that got pulled out of committee. That was not the case the last two years. There was only a handful of bills that, that, uh, that really got called the rule on the floor of the Senate. Um, that was not the case the last two years. So you had a very uh, a good, a good president who followed. Having served just under uh, Dean Cannon for two years and then and then Speaker Weatherford now, uh, and certainly the difference in money is is, is where it's night and day. When you're four billion short one year and two billion short another year, and then this year. Uh, you've got some extra revenue, it makes life a lot easier for the, the leader that doesn't have to cut funding in different places. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, um, under both conditions, uh, both speakers serve very well. Uh, Will was able to be a, a little more inclusive uh, because of the, I think, the situation with the money, and it, uh, it, it helped smooth things over between the parties. Okay, once again, I'm going to ask Representative Zimmerman to select the first question. We've asked the legislators to try, or to try and limit their response to two or three legislators at most. If we have all eight respond to every question, we'll have time for about two questions. So we're going to try and limit it to two or three legislators at most in responding to your question. So the first question, Representative Zimmerman. Uh, I'm going to pick somebody I don't know. Yes, sir. My name is David Outlaw. I basically to make that to me. But I have something to add to this near year our heart and that's the medical coverage that we have. And I just wanted to ask for those that voted against the Medicaid bill, if they were a little bit embarrassed in having their picture on the front page of today's uh, FMA Bank for keeping their health coverage that they don't have. Again, on that vote, 
but in this year, uh, you know, it, it, the, the plan failed in the Senate. So, uh, you know, we, we really had a, had a golden opportunity. Okay, Representative Bruce Hahn, would you select the next question? Please wait for the mic. Deidre Roberts, um, Mr. Ahern, who is Uncle Sugar Daddy? <laughs> Thank you for that question. <laughs> that would be our, our um, 16 plus trillion dollar in debt uh, uh, you know, partner in, in many ways at the federal level who is proposing to add uh, and, and has proposed in, in the budget, the latest proposed budget for the next 10 years, another um, up to $24 trillion. Uh, again, uh, money that doesn't exist at this time. Uh, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the difference between what the House plan was offering and what we would do if and when, and probably more like when, uh, they fail to be able to keep their end of the part. Where would the money come from? Education. Those are the budget drivers. Representative Peter? Hi, my name is Carol. Uh, Representative Peters, what's the most important thing that you look for coming out of the next session? Coming out of the next session? Wow, I haven't gotten over the first session, and I'm so proud of the stuff that we were able to bring home in the first session. Um, can I switch that? Yeah. <laughs> um, actually, what I am really proud of, and I will tell you, what I'm really proud of this session, and I'm hoping that we can grow this next session. Um, and there's two things. One of them is the work we did with Sandy College. We're able to expand the orthotics and prosthetic program that Sandy College has to offer. And that, I believe, will make them the number one college in the country. And right now, there's only 10 colleges in the country that offer that degree. And that gives us not only a niche, but it gives us a great opportunity to expand research and development and economic development. And I look forward to working with the college and growing. All right. Um, Representative Peters, would you like to take the Jerry Evans and Senator, my question is actually to you. You just commented on every state employee getting raises except for the legislature. Putting the judges back to where they were almost eight years ago, giving minor raises to people who have only had a first raise in eight years, that's something to be really, really proud of? Well, Jerry, I, I don't think that uh, I don't think that I'm proud of that. What I'm what I'm trying to say is that, you know, even though legislators may not pay as much as you might think they should pay for health insurance if they're a member of the House. You know, their salaries certainly are less than what they were seven years ago. Their salaries have not been made up in any way. At least judges, judges make 140, 150 grand a year. Um, state legislators make 29,000 a year. And it's the same thing it's been for six or seven years. And I'm not advocating a raise, I'm just saying you, 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 know, you just need to look at the, the total picture. Most of us work full time for that. Okay, Representative Hooper. Well, oh, I hate to call on Elliot, but I guess I will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Elliot Stern, and I want to tell you how proud and pleased I am that this delegation brought something back to Pinellas County. On the, uh, governor's desk since a five million dollar appropriation for the College of Business Building at USF St. Pete. And it's thanks to the efforts of all of you. Thank you very much.
Senate, again, failed to pass the current trigger bill, what I like to call the current empowerment bill, for the second year in a row. We have five schools in this county currently under uh, state uh, turnaround status. Do any of you, especially in the Senate, can you tell me any school in this country that has had the parents successfully transform a public school into a better school than what they had. And this gives me the opportunity to act in a bipartisan fashion by thanking Senator Jack Blackfellow for being one of the crucial votes in a tie vote to kill the private corporation trigger bill uh, in the Senate. That, that was a beautiful thing, and I congratulated him when I saw him. My reasons, but uh, I don't know. This whole idea of parents, yeah, I think it's a misnomer that it's parent trigger. It really is. There are other interests at work here. Uh, parents, I'm a parent. I have three kids, uh, 20 through uh, 15 year olds, uh, and I don't have a lot of time to run a school. So uh, parents could help by having their kids do homework. Thank you. Thank you. I want to take that one too. Um, and I appreciate your, your remarks, but you know, I, one of the reasons that I voted the way I voted is what I've seen going on in Pinellas right today and up in Pasco County at Lucucci Elementary. The in our current statutes and rules, we have the ability to come in and redo schools through the public mechanism through our school board. Uh, we've had uh, we've had the entire staff of a number of local schools that have been replaced or had to reply. Uh, I'm sorry, had to apply for a reappointment. And I I just like to take the opportunity to see how that works before I go in any more of an extreme fashion. Might be a day I can support that bill. I don't think it's nearly as bad and dangerous as a lot of people make it out. Absolutely. The, the parent trigger bill really, this, this year, here's what it said. It said if 50% of, if you got petitions for, from 50% of the parents of the school, then the school board, and the school board only, that was the only decided there was no appeal on the Senate bill, the school board only must consider, not shall adopt, must consider the parents' wishes. Now, I, I don't know why that's so radical. If 50% of the parents of a school if that's failing, said, hey, I, I think we should choose option A or option B or option C. And I think that's what we should do, is consider what those parents want. I can't imagine sending my child to a failing school and knowing that next year, you know what, it might fail again. And the failing year is going to fail again. And there's nothing I can do about it. Okay. One more time. Thank you, sir. And I don't know how you turn a school around without empowering parents. Um, as I read the article in the paper of the, the different principals that were being replaced and, and some that were staying, um, only the first one from the fundamental school talked about hoping how parents would be knocking on his door soon and, and what it would take to turn that school around. And I, I just think it's so critical to engage parents and, and the, the hopes, I think, of, of all of us that, that understand that. Uh, really uh, get what, what we were trying to do with that parent empowerment bill. Thank you. The, the thing that's the scariest about the parent trigger bill or the private corporation takeover trigger bill is that in other states there have been concerted efforts by groups that are paying to go out and propagandize and recruit and uh, push parents to uh, act in the way they do, even with gift giving and a variety of other things. So I, I think it's a little more nefarious than uh, some might think. Senator Brown, is your turn to select the question? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Well, I want to reference HP 999 and SP 1684, the worst environmental bill to ever be presented, in my opinion the legislation. Yet, we're supposed to be stewards of the earth, but 
with improved veto. Now, thanks to Jacqueline Vallis, Senator Lavella, there were some amendments at the end that did mitigate the damage somewhat, but it still passed. Now, will you tell me why it passed? There were a number of different issues that people criticized. It kind of became a Christmas tree. We stripped off some of those issues that were criticized. But the essence of the bill as it began is, is something that I, I can defend. And that is, it's a very simple principle that said that if you're applying for a permit with a local government, they should only have three chances to come back and ask you more questions. Because you, if you're a business owner, and you're trying to start a business or trying to develop a piece of property or something like that, you know, you need to be able to do that in a timely, cost-efficient mechanism. And the never-ending flow of questions has to have some limit to it. That was the basis for that bill to start with. And there's another element in there that was incredibly important to Pinellas County, and our residents came to me and asked me to write that bill for them, and that was the submerged land lease. And currently, if you live in a multifamily home and you have a condominium or a townhouse and you have a, a dock with a boat slip, you have to pay a permit fee and you're taxed on that fee. You have to pay a lease to the state on the submerged land and you are taxed on that. And then you are taxed on the money that your condominium association charges for their maintenance of that dock. But across the canal, on a single family home, who might have a 40 foot yacht on their dock doesn't pay a dime and it's not fair, it's not equitable, and Pinellas County's right behind Miami and how much they pay on those unfair, unequitable taxes. And the 999 helps stop that. So we got a question? Yes, sir. And then last year. Okay. Uh, my name is Matt Fora. Um, I just need a show of hands, and if anybody wants to comment on this, that'd be good too. I'm interested if you support a bill that has two, just two provisions. One, restore the minimum yellow signal times to the federal minimums, and two, offer penalties for municipalities that don't <coughs> follow them and have red light cameras. I don't know if I have to raise my hand for that because I proposed a bill uh, initially two years ago that uh, talked about the standardizing the yellow light timing and uh, making sure that it was fair for, for everybody across the state. And because we were in the shortfall and lengthening the lights uh, cost the state money, we weren't able to, to pass that. Hopefully, uh, that will be back again uh, next session. Okay. Well, that was the uh, Senate companion to representing Bayern's bill in 2011, and I think it's unconscionable that local governments would play with the timing on life just for revenue purposes. Representative Brandes? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, I just want to say one, one, one quick thing, and that is, I know we talk a lot about, but you hear a lot about that, that red light cameras are all about safety. Go find me a community in Florida that's losing money on red light cameras that still has the program. If it's all about safety, they're going to care about red light cameras, whether they're making money or whether they're losing money. All right. Well, we're done then. Zimmerman. There's another, another thing that could be done as well, and that is the delay once the light turns red. Uh, currently, I think it's 3.30 seconds of a second is when the camera actually goes off. Uh, that forces people to slam on their brakes, which causes accidents. Delaying that camera action could also save the light. Okay, we still have about 15 minutes left, so this is the Zinger round. You can only ask Zinger questions. So we will start with Representative Zimmerman once again. Do you want to select the Zinger questions? Uh, actually, uh, are the students going to be able to ask? Absolutely. Okay, I'd like to. They have to raise their hand. Raise your hand. <laughs> students, they just go to the school that I teach at, so uh, they're going to probably ask me a really hard question, but this isn't a solvable one. Uh, Tyler Val, uh, this question comes from the section on teacher evaluation. It says that all classroom teachers and student administrators must be evaluated using either a learning growth or a student achievement measure. 
Does this mean that a teacher could um, get a low evaluation if said teacher has a student who doesn't care, that doesn't try? Uh, yeah, that, that is true. Uh, we, we have students too that we're able to, um, but I feel like this was a uh, question here, but it wasn't. Uh, we have, uh, first of all, I, I want to say the good news is that with new legislation that we passed, uh, teachers will not be evaluated based on the performance of students that they don't actually teach, which is the way it's been in the past. Uh, that was the most unfair thing that we had going, and that's one of the reasons why the parent trigger was a terrible bill right now, because these schools are being judged based on evaluations of teachers that were severely flawed. Um, but the answer to that is that uh, we are currently evaluated on students that don't care, that are on oxycodone, that don't come that often. So, thank you. Anybody else want to comment on that? Okay, Representative Rashawn. Hi, my name is Leonard Schmidt. Uh, I just wondering, personally, I'm against nuclear power, mostly because of uh, the safety and the uh, storage of spent fuel rods and this seemingly forever. And we don't know what those costs add up to because of the time period involved. Is anybody on the panel willing to um, help cancel the debate about the nuclear cost recovery fee simply by let's just kill all nuclear in Florida and switch to all new energy sources being from solar power or renewable energies? So my question is, is anybody up there willing to kill nuclear power completely? Thank you. I, I think I'm fairly safe in saying that I don't think anyone in this panel would agree to kill all nuclear power. That, that even though they're struggling with finding uh, good places for waste, that, that's a little problem. But uh, my bill repealed the ability of power companies to take money from us that we have not agreed to give. And uh, there are other names for it, but I won't go into that. Um, but I, nuclear power can be, you know, has provided clean energy. That's not an issue. I'm not an anti-nuke per se. I am an anti-waste and an anti-taking from utility customers uh, that don't agree to give. Thank you. If I might uh, add to that, we must have policies that are broad, that include all forms of energy, both gas and renewables at the same time, while we explore the costs and the expense of, of nuclear. To borrow my good friend Ivan Penn's headline in the Tampa Bay Times, the math doesn't add up. Right. But certainly the emphasis ought to be on all forms of renewable, uh, including gas. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we uh, obviously the advanced nuclear cost recovery fee has become a, an issue that's uh, can cause a lot of concern, uh, and it, it concerns me. Uh, this year, Senator Brandis and I, along with a couple of other Tampa Bay senators, uh, filed legislation that I think will begin to get that under control. It's not a repeal. A repeal isn't going to pass. Uh, so we looked for some alternatives to, number one, reduce the interest rate uh, that these utilities can, can charge on it. Uh, and secondly, to make it real clear that the Public Service Commission has the responsibility and duty every year to look at the continuing viability of these projects. You know, the other key issue, and this may make you feel a little better about where nukes are, but it's about the market. There, nobody's investing in nukes right now, and that's why there's an advanced cost recovery provision, because it raises money that couldn't be raised in the marketplace. It's taking care of itself. Nukes are so expensive, they're really only prospering in places where you have captive peoples uh, in China, India, whatever. That's where they're building them because they can tax the people and they have no say so. We thought we covered this in 1776 or 1765. 
taxation without representation, but we're kind of addressing it again. Hopefully, we'll have a referendum to take care of it. Thank you. Representative Peters, can I select a question? Representative Peters, here's the My name is Lois Breeze. Um, I'd like to go back to a question that was addressed earlier. Uh, Mr. Weatherford said when he was opposed to the expansion of Medicaid in the state, <clears throat> that the reason he was doing so is because that money was coming out of taxpayers. I'd like to address the question to uh, Ahern, Hooper, and Peters, since you were the House representatives that voted against uh, Medicaid, isn't the $600 uh, that you are getting subsidized also coming out of the taxpayer's pocket? And how do you justify that hypocrisy without expanding Medicaid? The, di the difference is uh, we balance our budget in the state of Florida. Uh, the, the federal government has not proposed, nor, nor will it be able to propose, any sort of balanced budget. And for us, as, as legislators in the state, that look at it long-term perspectives for the state, for future legislators, that would have to make up the difference for any shortfalls that might be coming from this uh, the, from the federal government that, that, that wants to um, offer this in many ways, uh, a bribe, I'd, I'd say, to uh, expand this program. Again, we had a solution in the House um, that would have given us time to look at it. The only people that weren't covered in the House plan were childless adults. That was the difference in the numbers. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. As we sit here today, Florida is one of 30 states that has either rejected the federal program or not addressed it yet. One of 30. So we're not the Lone Ranger out here. As we sit here today, two years ago, the federal government promised us we're going to have a program that will reimburse you for clean solar energy rebates. They promised us. Two years later, we had gotten nickel. So, uh, we're talking about a lot, a lot of yen here. That's a lot of yen, $51 billion, on a promise from someone who can't pass a budget A or balance a budget. I just think that's irresponsible. Shame on our federal government for not passing a budget themselves. Okay, and I had a different perspective. And when I was on the floor, I brought it up. And what I'm frustrated with is I have yet to see the media or really even our legislature debate the system in which we were going to put a million more people. And can the system that Florida has manage a million more people? And when it came down to it, and I would say the amount of communications I got was probably 50-50. We were evenly split in what I was getting from my constituents. So what I did is I called, because the Senate's plan was to put a million people in kid care. So I called the pediatrician's office who work with kid care, and I ask them how the system works, how they collect money, what money they collect, and what does that mean? And I'd really like to finish my statement on this, if that's if you would oblige me on that. Sure. Here's 20 when I spoke to the doctor's offices, when I found some that had kid care and they were providers, which was the first challenge, then when they told me how they collect the money and what money they don't collect because they don't collect any, and I said, could you manage any more if we put a million more people in this system? And they said, no, we can't. Absolutely not. We cannot take any more. And that's what made me make the decision. It had nothing to do with the money. And the debate has been entirely about the money instead of the reality of getting it in the Senate. The, the other side of this is that we, regardless of what's being said, we're paying already. The people that are getting, they're getting health care, they're going, no, it's not BS. People are showing up to the operating, to the uh, emergency room, and 
and getting health care in the most expensive way they can get it. And, and that's the truth. Uh, and so we have crowd out in the emergency room. We go to somebody has a heart attack, stroke, whatever. We go to get services there. We have people that have you know, earaches or a cold or the flu or whatever. And you have other people there that are getting you know, the most expensive medical care possible because we have to have all these specialists you know, neurologists and heart surgeons and so on and so forth in the emergency room. We need to fund that game. Okay, I think we have... Okay, I just want to add to that two things. One, it's the difference between life and death to expand health care coverage.
and, and I'm a big, I teach journalism, so I'm a big supporter, but what you always read in the paper is not necessarily what we're focused on up there. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us. Um, two things. Uh, some of you know ever since I was arrested and prosecuted for protesting the sales of bongs and crack pipes and marijuana pipes in stores, particularly those across from high schools like Gibbs High School in St. Pete. Uh, eight years now, I finally got a bill passed that peels away the hypocrisy and the charade of that existence. Uh, proud of that. Secondly, I'm not proud that we didn't get grandparents' rights passed this year. Uh, some of you are aware of the Michelle Parker disappearance case where the father of the children is a person of interest and he's been denying access to the grandchildren of uh, Michelle's parents. We tried to make Florida one of those states where it respects grandparents' rights to visitation and to maintain a relationship with their grandchildren if a parent is deceased, comatose, or, in persistent, uh, or missing in action. One representative in the House killed that bill. I hope to come back at it next year on behalf of grandparents. You know, what we didn't talk about today is some of our most vulnerable. And what I'm really pleased, and I mentioned it earlier, is our foster care. We were spending less per child in foster care than any other county in the state. And I'm pleased that the sheriff now has more resources and Eckerd has more resources to take care of our children that by no means the things that they did often, they've been put into a system that's very really difficult. The normalcy bill gives them an opportunity to be a normal kid and not have that label being a foster kid. And so they can grow up with more of a lifestyle and if they want to go have a slumber party, go to a slumber party, they can. Well, right now, before this bill was passed, they couldn't. They couldn't leave the county. They couldn't have a normal life. They couldn't get a driver's license. And now they can. And we had kids that if they turned 18 and they were a senior in high school and they turned 18 and 17, they had to go out of their foster home, move into an apartment and become independent, even though they were still a senior in high school. But that's not the case anymore. And that's what I'm most proud of because this legislature took care of our most vulnerable and I'm very proud of that. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I love Pinellas County. I've lived here for 30 some odd years. Um, it, I think we have many treasures and I'm very happy to have been a part this year and, you know, kind of reinforcing some of those treasures that we have in our county here. Uh, the, the beginning of the new business school at uh, USF St. Petersburg, what a, what a fine institution we have down there. And I think uh, all of us should be proud of the fact that we're going to begin that business school. Uh, we had a good year in peach tree nursery. We all know how important peaches are to our community. And in Clearwater, the Clearwater Marine Aquarium, and that little dolphin with a prosthetic tail has become a very important part of the future revitalization of downtown Clearwater. And with Representative Hooper's leadership, we were able to uh, strike a real strong blow for, for downtown Clearwater's future up there this year. It's my privilege to represent you. Thank you very much for the honor. Typically, every session, over 2,000 bills get filed during the process. And of that 2,000 plus, about 200 pass. So 90% of everything we try to do goes down to the drain. We only have to pass a budget. That's all we have to do. Anything above that is a plus. Um, yes, I have a color photo on the front page of the Tampa Bay Times. This is not. This is a contact sport, and if you are, are weak of heart or faint of heart, uh, don't get in this process because you'll get your feelings hurt, and that's okay. Um, it's it is a process, and, and, and you you have heard from everyone here. We cover the whole spectrum, and every bill is exactly like Representative Zimmerman said. There is no black and white. It is only gray. And you hope it shades a little toward the darker side than it does the light gray side. It's a pleasure to serve you. I hope I haven't sounded too pessimistic here today. I'm just trying to give a little reality and uh, honesty regarding uh, the process um, and, and not saying it's a big kumbaya. I knew that going into it. Uh, you know, having worked in the House for four years, it was a little different then because the Democrats were in the majority, but be that as it may. Most of us, though, at this, at this table here, uh, 
we vote 90 some percent for, you know, bills in a bipartisan way. But let's not over exaggerate uh, bipartisanship and say that uh, it's across the board and this is a, a new era. It may be a little better than the last speaker, but we can do a lot better. I think the preordination of uh, not supporting uh, health care for Florida families is a, is a major family. Uh, I had a great license plate bill with uh, Senator Lapala, which was for the fallen heroes. Now the Freemasonry and the Wildflower Bill got passed, but the bill honoring the three police officers who were killed in the line of duty did not get passed. I see that as a major bill. Yeah. You know. uh, first, thank you for letting me serve you. And uh, that's, it's truly an honor and a pleasure. And thank you for those who are well, I'm in session. Thank you for calling and reaching out to our office. Let me tell you, I will take the challenges from the state of, that the state of Florida has, for the opportunities that California has, Illinois has, and Connecticut has every day of the week. The truth of the matter is, Florida is in great shape. It really is. And I know you feel, some of you don't feel like it is, but I can tell you, go travel to California. Go look at the situation that's occurring in, in Pennsylvania or Illinois right now, where they're talking to their teachers and saying, how much of your pension can we cut because we can't afford to pay you anymore? And, and those, those situations are not happening here. And it's because you've had great leadership in the legislature. It's because you, you're, you're going to continue to have great leadership as long as you have a little weather for a few case. And the next progression of, of leaders as well is, is great. And, and you have a phenomenal delegation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tiger Bay members, for uh, hosting us again this year. And uh, I always look forward to this meeting. It always starts and ends on time, which is a real plus for me. But, uh, um, you know, going forward, um, the uh, school safety is going to be a priority uh, for me in the next legislative session. Uh, we've seen some incidents around the country, and I've talked to um, some of the school resource officers. In fact, I met one today. We talked a little bit about uh, the situation and, and what we can do to make it better and, and how we might uh, react to that legislatively. So I'm looking forward to doing that. And as a uh, a member of the Higher Education Appropriations Committee, I did uh, also have one um, uh, bring back to the area, and, and it was to double the amount that the Florida Holocaust Museum gets from $100,000 to $200,000 in order to uh, continue to advocate the teaching programs and the lessons that they teach uh, that, uh, to our students about what happened 